we will head into a presentation from Mike Stevenson and Jeremy Holden about podcasting. Hello, everybody, and thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Jeremy Holden. I'm the Communications Director for the ALS Association. And more important for our purposes here today, I am a co-host of Connecting ALS, a weekly podcast that I have the great fortune of hosting with Mike Stevenson, who's with me today. Uh, it's a weekly show uh, where we bring to you or bring to our audience uh, stories from the front line of the fight against ALS. Uh, Mike, happy to be with you today uh, with, with our friends from the International Alliance of ALS MND Associations. Thanks, Jeremy. It's good to see you as always. I know we get to, to chat several times throughout the week, but it's good to be in front of a, a new audience and and talk a little bit about our show. Uh, as you said, I'm looking forward uh, to the conversation. Yeah, well, you know, it's a show that I was very fortunate enough to join on to earlier this year, but it's one that you have a little bit of experience uh, in advance. This is kind of something that you brought into the world. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the genesis of Connecting ALS and, and, and how you how you launched this podcast and, and why. Sure, happy to. Uh, I wish I could take more of the credits, but truly the idea for the podcast came from the ALS community. Uh, we're always taking feedback about how we can, can reach uh, folks differently and, and ways to share more personal stories. And that was a huge motivator. We're, we're often hearing from those we serve that we need to give more of a voice to the ALS community and share their stories and their experiences. And because podcasting has become such a massive and, and popular uh, vehicle over the last several years, it made sense uh, to give it a shot. And to be honest, there aren't many health and human centric shows out there. Uh, so much of the podcast world, as you know, is, uh, entertainment and sports and things like that. And um, there are very, very few shows that address uh, healthcare topics and even fewer um, built around things like ALS. Many of our listeners know, uh, Ryan, ALS is a disease where each day becomes slightly more challenging than the one prior. Absolutely. And you mentioned your voice. Has that been uh, the most challenging thing of late for you physically? Yeah, um, recently that was the toughest part, um, especially with two young kids. Well, uh, Finn is seven right now, Liv is four. Reading to them at bedtime is going to be to be more of an adventure than it used to be. And just, I think I I tend to speak in shorter spurts now than I used to. Understandably, yep. and I suppose with the kiddos when you when you need to kick that dad voice in yes you're just looking for that are you it you're... sounds more like this now <laughs> you got the beeps there you I, go. I got the beep on the wheelchair i use when uh when we need a stern voice it's smart they know to listen to that like yep, oh yep. i better pay attention that's the equivalent of using their full name Mike, you talked about the emergence and the growth of podcasting. Uh, estimated last year, 88 million people in the United States listened to at least one podcast. That number is expected to almost double by the end of 2023. Uh, a recent survey showed that about 40% of people between the ages of 24 and 40 had listened to at least one podcast in the past month. Mm. So podcasting isn't going anywhere. So I think it was about figuring out a way to start playing in that field, to start telling these critically important stories in a platform where we know people are listening and engaging. Um, and you talked about finding experts, about telling those stories of people living with ALS, their caregivers, but going to researchers. One of the things, Mike, that you and I talk about regularly is that we're not neurologists, we're not clinical researchers, we're not clinicians working on the front lines uh, at, at a care center, uh, we're not lawmakers, but we can go to them and give them an opportunity to tell their stories to our audience. We first got funding in the DOD approps back in 2007, and it was a $5 million appropriation. And 
boy, I can remember when we first got that in. It was it was big time because we had our foot in the door. We had we had folks within the Department of Defense who were were keyed in on on what needed to be done when it came to finding cures and therapies and and again that that nexus to our veterans. And so you you think about where where we were in 07 now to be looking at a, a funding level of a forty million dollars, pretty significant given that we doubled it from last year's approps funding of, of twenty million dollars. But what what we're able to do really is to target funding to the most promising preclinical research, but also providing some resources to fund early phase clinical trials. We, we we all hear about this this valley of death between promising preclinical research and human clinical trials. And so making sure that there is a path and a path that you, you don't get bogged down, you don't get held up, you don't just kind of wither away because you either don't have the the, the funding or the focus. And so focusing on the Department of Defense and at the NIH specifically to target ALS has been a priority. It's also had an impact, um, the pandemic has, on how people listen to podcasts. Uh, daily commutes are a huge, huge driver of podcast traffic. And since people are working from home more, that kind of went away. They're not necessarily in gyms where they're listening to podcasts, working out as much. Um, but they are at home. They are a captive audience. And a lot of people are trying to find different ways to pass the time. And podcasts can be a good source for that, too. So starting in kind of April, May, uh, podcasts around the world, including ours, started to see their numbers go up as people um, were finding different things to listen to or maybe trying different shows that they wouldn't have otherwise listened to, but with more time on their hands, um, they were giving it a shot, and that was good uh, for us. We, of course, didn't want uh, COVID to take over the show, so we tried to be careful about um, not making it the main focus of our interviews, but we did feel it was important to hear from families uh, about how they're being impacted, about how that layer in addition to living with ALS was uh, impacting their year. Uh, for a lot of families living with ALS, it's meant increased isolation and an abundance of caution uh, to make sure they're staying safe. So one of the first things we did when the pandemic really ramped up was connect with people around the country about how they were managing through it all. Keeping that space, but then also, you know, you so have to worry about anything and everything that everyone touches now. I have an Alexa that with the drop in and everything else that way that I'm able to, while at work, be able to call into him that he doesn't have to worry about picking up a phone, that I can, you know, speak with him while I'm at work or different things that way to make sure that he's okay. His daughter got him a mix play for Christmas that she's able to download pictures as she comes across when she was little or the grandkids and, and you know, every day there's we put that on and it's all positive pictures that are coming through of happy moments. Patty talked about her connection to the ALS Association Northern New England chapter, the use of technology to continue providing services and to make their lives easier to manage, and the importance of planning ahead. They're now looking to do more things uh, video-wise. We did do a chat a couple weeks ago that we were able to speak with other people on and there was a gentleman that was on there that you know, I, I don't think he could have, because of the stage that he is with his ALS, I don't know if he could have come to a meeting, but it was so informative to be able to speak and listen to him on that, that I learned a lot. Looking forward, knowing that we have about a year of shows under our belt now, what do you see as kind of the next logical steps for connecting ALS? Well, that's a great question, Mike. Um, I, I think that 
that continuing audience growth uh, is is important. I, you know, we've we've talked about ways to invest in marketing the show and then using those channels to expand the audience a little bit. Um, I, I think continuing to get guests and build that repertoire of folks that'll come on is going to help. Uh, you know, I think we, we talked to some really leading voices in the fight against ALS last year. So continuing to do that, I think is important to growing audience and, and, and growing the footprint of the podcast. I think it's about also finding stories that are central to our audience, um, but also resonate outside of our audience with other groups uh, that are uh, interested in the same content and the same questions that we're trying to ask. I, I think we recently honored uh, National Family Caregivers Month uh, by bringing on someone from the National Alliance of Caregivers, recognizing that caregiving is important to the ALS community. It's also important to a lot of people. And so how do we build that audience and bring stories to, to folks at, in, in a way that enlarges our audience? Uh, you know, we recently had an election here in the United States. And, you know, Mike, with the pandemic going on, with uh, the challenges to voting in person, mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to think about how do we tell that story? If somebody has mobility challenges, um, how do, how do you vote? What are the protections in place? That's something that is important to our community, but it's important to other communities as well. And it gave us an opportunity to sit down with the good folks over at the Paralyzed Veterans Association to get a sense of what they were hearing from their audience. What were some of the shared questions that, that, that our community had that their community could talk to us about? So how do we build those bridges and build those connections across communities uh, and tell stories that are important, not just to the folks that we serve, uh, but to a, a broader audience. I'm curious what you're hearing from your members about what their concerns and their experiences as they think ahead to how they make sure that their voices are heard and that their ballot is cast and counted. For our members, a lot of our guys actually vote in person. They like to go to the polls. And so in order to do that, being people with disabilities, guys who use wheelchairs, we've got to ensure that we've got polling place access. And that's a lot of you know, pre-prepping how we vote, you know, kind of plan your vote. And so sometimes once our guys know where the polling place is, depending on their state, if they have the opportunity to early vote, they will do so. If not, only on voter day, like November 3rd, what they might do is go, go check out the poll ahead of time to ensure that there is access at the poll, meaning like accessible parking, a path of travel to the entrance of the polling place, just kind of investigate what their needs are and how they might be met. But the real deal is voting is everyone's constitutional right, which is guaranteed if you're 18 years or older and a citizen, but you got to be registered. And so all our members are out there want to exercise that right. One of the conversations that you and I had early on, Mike, was about the length of any episode. Mm -hmm. We generally come in at around 20 minutes, um, but we've also said that we're going to let the story dictate how long any given episode is going to be. Uh, if we need three guests in 45 minutes to tell the story the right way, we're going to do that. Um, and, you know, the way audiences listen to podcasts is going to shift. We don't necessarily know in what direction, so how do we build in that flexibility into questions of not just the topics, but the length and who the right guests are going forward. I mean, but those are growth opportunities for us in terms of expanding the audience, expanding the footprint of connecting ALS. Yeah, we've been so fortunate to have a number of really amazing guests, and I know that we've name-dropped several of them uh, during this presentation, but really... Uh, we're lucky uh, to have access to these folks and that they're willing to come on to the show. And, and that's something that I think uh, kind of permeates throughout the ALS community and the scientific community in, in ALS because, uh, and we, we talk about it on the show, collaboration is so key. And because ALS is, a, is, you know, those impacted by ALS are a smaller subset of the population, 
we need to do everything we can to amplify those voices and boost that signal. And uh, our guests recognize that, I think. And it's the reason they've been willing to come on the show and help us raise awareness and help us get the information out uh, because they know that we all need to work together and we all have the same end goal in mind. So to think of our podcast as, you know, a small sliver of that awareness building that's possible, uh, we're just really appreciative of everyone being willing to chip in and come on the show and, and chat with us. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you everybody uh, for uh, joining us on the session and for inviting us to participate. We really appreciate yeah. the opportunity to talk about Connecting ALS. And I think we're going to be popping on live here uh, in a minute or two to answer any questions that you have. But uh, Jeremy and I just really want to thank you uh, for the chance to come on and talk about the show. And, and you know, go to connectingals.org and subscribe. <laughs> Yeah, get the plug in there. Make sure wherever That's you listen right. to your podcasts, uh, search for Connecting ALS and, and give it a listen. Well, thank you, Mike and Jeremy. That was fascinating. Um, I'm curious, I have a two-part question for you, and I'm looking to see if some other questions may come through the chat. Um, the first question, the two-parter is, first of all, how do you source your topics? And secondly, what was the most surprising topic over the nearly one year that you've worked on this? Uh, Jeremy, I'll let you tackle the first part. I'll take the second one. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> um, you know, it's we have weekly meetings where we go through one guests that are available that we know are um, willing to come on and tell their stories. And so, you know, we, we know we can plan a calendar out a little bit, knowing that there are, maybe there's a, a week of recognition of respiratory care. So we can source that out and talk to our colleagues on the care services teams to say, hey, who's a great respiratory tech or respiratory therapist that, that we can have on that can talk to us about that. Some of it is just looking at developments and trying to stay topical and know that if there's a big development in, uh, in, on the research front, can we get that principal investigator to come on and talk to us? So it really is just being committed to having that weekly planning session, trying to, you know, we went um, on our first one going two weeks out and now we're six weeks out. And so how can we get to that place where we're maybe uh, two or three months out, but also being flexible so that uh, if, if news breaks, we can shift gears very quickly. Uh, but it is building that credibility and knowing that, uh, building up trust with people that they'll come back on the show uh, and, and maybe they'll trust that they can come on with, with, you know, with less than three weeks notice and they don't know, need to know the questions in advance because they trust us to have that conversation in a way that um, is going to be collaborative. Yeah, and I will answer the, the second part of that question. And let me back up first. Thanks so much for having us uh, in the session and, and allowing us to be a part of it. We're thrilled to, to get to talk about the show and, and offer some of the insight into that. And I appreciate all the, the kind words in the chat that are coming through. Uh, I saw some folks asking for the link. You can subscribe at connectingals.org or really wherever you listen to podcasts, you should be able to search for Connecting ALS and find it that way. But I think the second part of the question, and Andrea, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm forgetting it, but what was the most surprising topic uh, that we addressed? And I don't know how much of a surprise it was, but I don't think we necessarily expected to cover it when we did, but we get a fair bit of feedback uh, from folks living with ALS and their families and caregivers and loved ones uh, about the show. And something that came up pretty consistently after we started was um, intimacy and ALS. And so we wanted to make sure that we did that right. And we connected with um, a psychologist here in the United States at University in Pennsylvania to talk about uh, intimacy and kind of some of the questions that folks living with ALS have. And we sourced some of those questions from the community directly. Uh, and I thought we did that in a fairly thoughtful way, thanks to our brilliant guest. Um, but we, like I said, we, we never really know what it's gonna be um, from one month to the next. But as Jeremy was talking about earlier, now that we're planning further ahead, I think we have better expectations of the road ahead. Well, thank you for that. And yes, intimacy is a, is a big issue with the uh, ALS M&D population. 
and an important one to tackle. So thank you for all your work and we appreciate the presentation today. We look forward to listening in. No, thank you. Thank you so much.